I am on the phone with George Ingmeyer, and he is, George, are you a sound engineer, a sound tech? What is your title? That's a good question. I mean, I, I, I sound recordist is probably the, the, you know, best term for what I do on film sets, you know, commercials and documentaries and whatnot. I'm sure most of my listeners, if they've seen behind the scenes photographs or footage of documentaries, television shows, movies, they'll see that guy with the pole over their head mm -hmm. and they're wondering, sure. what is that guy doing? And why does he mm -hmm. have that pole over his head? So I just wanted to talk a little bit about that stuff and uh, uh, get your insights. Um, so first of all, Tell me about your career. How how long you been doing this, and how'd you get started? Well, I I, I guess I've been doing this kind of work for I say close to twenty five years. Um, but I've always been involved in recording sounds one way or another since I was a kid. But the you know professionally speaking, I would say I started about twenty five years ago, and um, it was you know a natural evolution out of my love of everything from music to uh, just recording sounds environmentally. Um, and I like the film aspect of it because it's, it just presents new challenges every time you're on a set or with a, you know, a, in a new environment. So it, you know, you're always learning new things, learning new solutions, meeting new people, you know? Yeah. And did, did you do any sort of, uh, courses or go to school for this or did you just sort of learn on set as you were going it's mainly learning on my own i mean the people jokingly sometimes refer to it as the dark arts because you're in the dark figuring it out but um i mean unlike say on a camera crew and on a film where you usually have more than one person just because of the challenges and a lot of times you're learning under somebody in a camera crew um I've only worked with one sound mixer in all my time um, who was like many years, you know, experience compared to me. And, and I learned a couple things there, but I've mainly just uh, figured things out on my own, watched some videos on, you know, how to conceal lavalier microphones or, you know, just look or, you know, it's been conversations at a sound like a house where you can rent a rental house where you can rent gear. Sometimes you, you know, those conversations are where you can learn little tidbits, but I would say about, I'd say about 95% self-taught. Okay. Um, and since I mentioned the poll earlier, sure. I've done that. Oh my gosh. It just, it'll kill you. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that really necessary? I mean, you you look and think, why don't they have some way of suspending it or in some way making it easier on the poor sound guy? Well, there, there's two parts to this. I'll say one is it, it'll it wear you out more if you, depending on how you're positioning your arms, if you think of your arms folded like almost like the top of the letter H, the cap, you know, the capital H. So your 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 arms are at right angles versus V's, where your arms are just kind of outstretched. Uh, the V's put more strain on you and drain. You'll your arms will tire more quickly. So a lot of it just has to do with you know proper positioning of you know your arms. But the a boom having a boom operator versus just having it on some sort of device is absolutely necessary for any anybody that's recording sound where the people are moving around a bit like if it's a sit-down interview like we were doing as i recall yeah there i had it up on a um a boom pole holder which was fine because they were mainly in the same position but these microphones are very directional they're kind of like telephoto lenses in the sense that they pick up things off in the distance really beautifully um, so you can, you can have the microphone further away from the subject more than you can a lot of microphones, but because of that, when their heads move around, um, you have to move the mic with that in mind, especially if you're on like a film set and you've got actors who are, you know, moving in the, in the scene, the, the microphone has to reflect 
that movement in order to maintain uh decent you know sound for the you know for the film itself so yeah yeah so uh, it's just a necessary evil yeah well i mean i i actually love it i mean i i like the because it puts you into the you have to be in the moment with what's happening and uh and in a way that you know, it's easy to kind of drift off into daydreams if you're just sitting there with it. Like, unless it's an interesting subject, sometimes I always joke that the hardest part of my job, say like for a, a lawyer commercial, is stay awake um, because I'm just hanging the mic above their heads and pressing record. You know, I mean, there's a lot more to it than that because you're a lot of layers to getting it right, making sure everything's working with camera, blah, blah, blah. But I love, I love booming. I think it sounds better. When I first started doing sound, I, you know, when I worked under a mixer, I was like thinking those wireless mics are fine. You know, let's just use those as, but he was like, no, you need to boom. And the reason being that it sounds better. It's, it's a, it's a wired connection. So you're, you know, for one thing, and you're not going to be challenged by the clothing noises that the microphone on the person can, you know, present when they're lavalier mics. And and, uh, I think, I mean, it's definitely not for everybody, but I mean, I've boomed for four or five hours straight. Wow. So, I mean, and, and I've boomed, I've had to like operate a, a boom pole, like in, I was on a shoot in Haiti and we were moving through a tent camp that was there after the uh, earthquake. So I was not just navigating with a boom pole. I was trying to figure out how to move through this makeshift city that had all kinds of overhead obstacles and people also wondering what the hell we were doing. So I was like, I was, and uh, I mean, but it also was super I don't, I don't want to say exciting because that's probably not the right word, but it definitely put, you know, put me in a position of like trying to figure out how to get it right, how to like not knock stuff off, uh, like, you know, people's like overhead, like people's literally like lines for their tents in this. It was a playground that was yeah. turned into a tent city. So, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I wanted you to address is, uh, to me, especially knowing now what I know about sound, one of the most laughable and discouraging things to hear on set is fix it in post. And what's what's so funny about that is when it comes to sound, people will watch a movie or a television program and they will forgive uh, bad lighting, they'll forgive bad acting, bad writing. Uh, they'll forgive so many things. But I've seen where they've done studies that people will be watching a a program and there'll be a lot of static or there'll be a lot of snow or there'll be just anything that's annoying and they'll mm-hmm. plow through it. They'll just keep going. But bad sound within... Yeah within less than a minute, if the sound isn't fixed, they'll turn it off. And it, it, I've listened to directors who would later talk about that. You forget that sound is the most important thing because that's the quickest to turn people off. They find it the most annoying. And yet Mm -hmm. when you're on set, I know I've been on so many sets where there would be noise in the background, different things going on. And the director or whoever was in charge, they just, it's like, well, we'll fix it in post. We won't worry about it. Or they get annoyed that the sound guy was saying, I'm hearing a refrigerator or I'm hearing an airplane or something. Uh, And does that discourage you? Does it frustrate you that it doesn't seem like sound gets the important attention it needs when it's as important as it is that's a that's a great question um i would i would say that i you know it, it depends on my mood for the day sometimes i'm able to let it roll off me other times just depending on the dynamics on the set or the importance of what's being recorded i might be a little more annoyed with it and sometimes i'm not as assertive as i should be and other times 
I may be overthinking it. Um, so, uh, and sometimes, I mean, to get kind of into the nitty gritty of it, there might be a distracting sound during a moment that's being shot that I know that moment isn't really a keeper anyway. So I just let it go because it might just be like, even though I'm not the editor, I, I'm an, I do edit. So I'm listening to something happening. And I'm like, that's not going to, this isn't really important. Whereas there could be something really important happening. And then I'm like, I'm very quick to like kind of gesture. There's a way to do it where you don't distract what's going on on the set and be like, we need to get that again, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I feel like sound should be given a little more attention than than it does but i also understand that that this that just comes with the territory it's just this is just baked in i mean they call it motion pictures so it's not motion sound even though sound as you as you you know correctly pointed out is the thing that will can make or break a scene because i think it's just our our instinct and our just or how we think about sound, you know, we sounds alert us to things. Right. So, and if they're distracting, we're, our brains are literally trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Whereas visually we can kind of, you know, offset what's going wrong and, and just ride it out. And you can also, you can also fix things in the editing process if there's a bad shot or you can look at it as stylistic. Um, you know, so. going, going along with that, when you say fixing it, the whole fix it in post, I know I have a, I have some friends who are, I guess, true sound engineers. I mean, they sit there with the boards and they have all mm -hmm. this incredibly complex software. As I understand, for the most part, there's virtually anything can be fixed in post if you have enough hardware and software it's just do you have thirty thousand dollars worth of equipment and ten thousand twenty thousand dollars worth of sound of software is that mm. the case is that true well no i mean yes and no i, I there's been vast improvements in um noise reduction software um, in particular, software I work with called Isotope. Um, uh, it's like I Z O T O P E. Um, they have like a, a suite that has come a long way in terms of noise reduction. I recently, just last week, was on a shoot that we were at Drago's um, and uh, this restaurant, and and uh, they were grilling oysters. So it's right. I mean, the sound was all being recorded right by a really loud. Uh, vent because you need a vent above a grill inside a restaurant it was super noisy and i let the director know and he was like you know they can see it and i was just like well there's nothing we can do about it but it was really horrible sound and i was i was able to at home just on my own he didn't even ask me i just wanted to see what i could do i was able to really fix it in a lot of ways but it wasn't it wasn't perfect but we've come a long way and we don't need as much money to, to, to uh, correct these problems because of the software and, and machine learning and artificial intelligence actually plays into that, believe it or not. Okay. It goes into, they've followed and, you know, they follow the movement of, you know, software, people running software and like, and it basically records their actions and decision-making and it's folded it in and it, these things are a lot of they're being automated now in ways that are are only going to get more and more advanced and uh, and possibly threaten the, some some income streams for people who have been doing it professionally for years. Yeah, um, I've only been in the industry, oh, I guess twelve or fourteen years, something like that. Uh, but even in the time that I've been in the stunning difference between what was capable back then and what's capable now. It's just mm. mind blowing, which like you said, on the one hand it does or can threaten certain jobs, but on the <laughs> other hand, it's opened up a world that, I remember when we first started our 
uh, production company, I had a friend who was working at a big studio and he said, oh, it's just not possible. You really can't start your own company. I mean, we've got, I have a person on staff that the lenses on the camera, each lens is over $25,000 a piece. And Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, that was true. They were using the highest end stuff, but the digital revolution had brought so much of that down that he wasn't even Mm. really aware of, which allowed us to get started. And then it's just amazing the amount of equipment that you can get and the software that you can get in every respect that allows people to, you know, start their own production company or start being a sound guy. And mm-hmm. you don't have to have a fortune in equipment to be able to do uh, yeah, a pretty decent job. Uh, you know, like for you, just bare bones minimum, if you just had to take the least amount of stuff to go do a particular job, how much would that cost? You know, just a boom pole, a pretty good mic, a little mixing. Uh, yeah, good. That's a good question. I mean, I, I I would say that like basing it on you know the average kind of when I get called out to a lot of shoots, they usually want two lavalier like wireless systems, a boom, and a mixer. So let's just go with that. You can have, depending on like the level of like gear that you're you're looking to like go out there on set with, you could you could have a package that would run, I want to say in the ballpark of fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars okay. for your like and but that's like a system I would I wouldn't show up on set with because I want I mean. I I want more reliable and bet, like longer range wireless systems. I want a I want um just better electronics when it comes to the actual recorder, and I want a better boom pole, like boom to be more shotgun mic. The pole itself is just what you know you you mount it on. So so I would say like my setup would be more in the ballpark of like bare bones even with what i'm talking about around 10 to 11 grand okay so that's with two well man you know, maybe a little higher than that but because uh, the wireless systems themselves can run you around 3500 per pack and you know the sennheisers you can get for 650 so or like the so yeah you could have a package of two grand or a package at 12 grand yeah, and that's something too. Um, that I have all kinds of listeners, so I never know who's going to be listening to a program. Sure. But uh, along this line, when someone's starting out trying to make their movie or a small company that's trying to do a commercial or something, and they may sometimes, I don't know your rate, and I'm not necessarily going to ask, but I know mm-hmm. we have hired sound guys that were a thousand fifteen hundred dollars a day and sure. people you know they're they're shocked that you know that much for just one day's work and they forget mm. that number one in an industry like this it's not like you do this every day you might work five or six days or ten days in a row at let's say fifteen hundred dollars a day which that's pretty good pay the only problem is then you might go two or three weeks where you don't get any calls at all. Sure. And so that's all a, that yeah. has to be amortized out. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, and I would say, you know, the, the range, the range for me could be, uh, you know, like tomorrow I'm on a, sh- I'm on a shoot. I don't know much about, and I'm, I'm an A2, which is like a, like a, the A1 would be like the lead guy. A2 is, kind of, I'm, you know, I'm like going to be putting mics on people, blah, blah, blah. And I think it's going to be um, probably about an eight hour day, maybe a 10 hour day, $300. It's not, you know, but it, I look at it like this, that's $300. I, I wouldn't be making sitting at home. Exactly. Um, but I couldn't be on a, like a shoot last week and it was like 1100 
and that was it was it was uh for like state farms having a convention and there's like a it's going to be like a uh, part of their a video during the convention itself and that was like an eleven hundred dollar a day and eleven hundred you know you, you break it in when you when people mention rates a lot of times they're talking about labor and gear so you, you know you're paying for their like the labor could for that breakdown say is seven hundred and four hundred for the gear because you're you're renting your your gear to the situation as well. Yeah, um, and that, that's that's the other thing too yeah. is that the gear itself, I mean you just mentioned 10 you know fifteen thousand dollars worth of gear and that's not that may just be what you're bringing on set that's certainly not everything that you own that has yeah. to be built up over time that has to that it gets wear and tear and yep. uh and eventually i don't know about all your equipment but i know some of the equipment we've got it just over time it doesn't talk to the new stuff and so it may be perfectly good, but it's just not mm -hmm. interacting well with whatever new stuff is out there. And so there's always an attrition rate where you're having to keep that equipment up. It's less of an issue with sound than it is cameras because a lot of times new cameras come out, new technologies, new new resolutions on cameras come out and people, your clients want the latest camera for wherever they're shooting. Whereas sound doesn't really have those growth spurts, luckily. Um, but then you have issues like the FCC selling off, uh, auctioning off certain frequency ranges. So that you could have wireless systems that are technically illegal to use because those frequencies are now owned by Verizon or, or their, those frequencies are now being, over, they've been taken over by um, emergency broadcasts. Like oh, there was wow. a certain, so that, that's kind of what happens in terms of attrition there. You, you lose access to technically you, you lose access to using those pieces of gear. Um, so it's exactly, that's the truth. Absolutely. You're like maintaining your gear, the wear and tear on it. Um, and just the growing challenges of uh, like the, what people will expect now. So you have to have more or be ready to have more at a moment's notice. I was on a shoot where I was told we need two mics, wireless systems. All of a sudden we needed the third. Luckily I thought to bring a third as a backup, but it became, you know, part of the seat, like what they needed. And there was no chance for me to be like, I don't have it, even though that's not what they asked for. So you got to always kind of have more of your sleeve. Yeah. Be ready for that. <laughs> so that's another. And so we're talking about at that point, we're talking about with microphones, we're talking about $13,000 just for the wireless systems. Yeah. Not, we're not talking about the recorder, the boom pole, the time code, lock boxes, uh, any other aspect of it. Just Just the wireless systems alone. 13 grand. Wow. So, yeah. And, and you, you could be on film sets where they want six to eight wireless systems. So multiply, let's just say four grand per system. So, you know, wow. eight <laughs> times four, that's 32 grand right yeah. there. Yeah. So that's why they're, that's why you're getting paid sometimes $1,500 in that day. Um, be, because you need to, you need to be ready and, and, it's so there's a lot of cash outflow, I guess, to keep this business yeah. going. Yeah. Um, I know you work on different, all sorts of sets. Is there a favorite that if you have your choice, you'd rather work on commercials or a movie or a TV series? Um, you know, I haven't done a lot of, I haven't done a lot of TV stuff. I haven't done uh, much in the way of narrative films. So those two are like out in a way because I don't know much about them. Interestingly, though, just as a digression, I'm I'm going to I, I got my master's, master of fine art and film production from the University of New Orleans, and I'm going to be working on their spring film, which is coming up in May, basically teaching students and helping a, a friend of mine who's directing it uh, for an 87 page feature. So it, it'll be my first real foray into like the uh narrative dramatic world so in terms of what i love the most i would say 
in, in a dollars and cents way, I love commercial shoes because they pay the most and they're, they're only a couple of days. So you, you know, you can make, you know, a couple grand easily in a couple of days work. Um, but in terms of like walking away and being like, Oh, that was interesting. I like documentaries, I, you know, and those tend to pay a lot less and are the most demanding. So it's like they have, they both have their pluses and minuses. Sometimes you want to like, just have a sense of like, you made a difference in the world by being involved in something that is a story about, you know, our humanity or, or just something happening or the environment or whatever else. And then there's those, those shoots where you're like, all right, I can pay all my bills or I can pay part of my monthly, you know, bills with this couple of days of work. And so I like a mixture of, of the two. I, I don't know if I necessarily want to be just in one or the other. And if, but if I had to pick, I would just, I would just do commercial shoots all the time yeah. because they, you know, commercial budgets tend to be high because of just the nature of, 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 um, you know, uh, media, you know, it's like commercials We're inundated with like ads. Right. It's, so, and they spend money, like the advertising world spends an enormous amounts of money. So they don't blink at dropping a decent amount of money for members of their crew. And I, I'm, I'm all right with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that in all respects, I've worked on movies, I've worked on commercials, um, I've worked on some pilots for television I haven't done in a series as such, at least not that I can remember, but uh, it is industry standard that even the big, big uh, directors, they will work and do a lot of commercials to make the bulk of their money so that they can go do a movie and have you know, they'll say, I want to have fun making a movie, but they make mm -hmm. uh, uh, the bulk of their money doing commercials because you can literally do a commercial for, say, Sony or Ford or something like that and make as much in a three day commercial as you do in a month working on a film. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm, that, that breakdown uh, right now for like the, the student film or it's a it's directed by a teacher but the, the film i just mentioned that for university of new orleans without getting into too specific of detail but you know i i would say that five days on that set is like part of a day on a commercial set yeah but i'm going to be like where i got my you know masters and 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 giving back because at a certain point no matter what you're doing it, it's it's always i think it's important to share with with others what you've learned because at some point you were given that from somebody else so it be a music uh, a professional field of any sort life itself it's good to like you know in the cycle of things to be you know and you learn by teaching yeah so I think there's I think there's some advantage to that, but in the dollars and cents of it all, I'm like I'm I'm taking, you know I'm taking that, a, a, you know making a sacrifice. But um, and they're going to be long days. Like a lot of these narrative things, you, people work. Anyone thinking about getting into this industry, I I just say if you be ready to work sometimes twelve to fourteen hour days. Uh, if you're going a TV, uh, like a TV or film set, especially. Yeah, film sets, an average day is considered 12 to 14. Uh, a long day, literally, is 16 yes. to 18. Yeah. And that's, you do 16 or 18 on Monday, and then you come in and do 16 to 18 on Tuesday, and you keep doing that uh, yeah. five, six days a week. It's really grueling, and that's where... <clears throat> Excuse me. That's where um, so many people who work in this industry, they'll work a movie, but then they have to work commercial gigs or just take a break for a while because it just wears you out. And that, that was going to be one of my next questions was for you, how much time do you sometimes have to spend away from your family? Um, how challenging is that? I I mean, I... I'm, 
I have a girlfriend and two cats and my girlfriend lives on in her own place. Um, she's completely, and what's important is she's, she's very much, uh, I mean, very supportive of whatever, like my schedule is demanding of me. Um, and so I, I'm lucky in that sense. I, I can imagine depending on the, you know, the dynamics of the challenges one has, one have and has in their, um, family situation, their, their, their home situation, it could be, it, it, it could be a lot harder. So, uh, I, I just, the thing that I guess I would say the challenges I deal with is I don't, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I have nothing going on all of a sudden I have all this going on. So I go from having all this free time to like, just, you know, it's go, 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 go. But um, because I don't work on film sets and I don't I don't work on these productions that run for weeks or sometimes months on end, I still manage to uh, like navigate that in my you know just my life with seeing other people and and being able to take care of of the needs you know whatever it's laundry yeah. <laughs> cooking for myself and I also do post work you know so I'm at home a lot making you know, money working in my pajamas on a laptop. Right. You know, so, uh, it, it's, it's good to be diversified, I think in, um, in the modern world anyway, but the challenges, uh, that, you know, away from family and home aren't that big. I mean, I, I, it would be hard if I had to go away for a shoot and I have traveled for shoots for my cats, because you know it's just a matter of find somebody to feed the cats but other than that I, I i'm pretty lucky yeah well one question people always have is why not go to hollywood or la i mean right now you're based in uh, uh louisiana in, in new orleans and that's uh that's really big but that hasn't always been the case uh uh, isn't it Marvel that's moved down there and really doing a tremendous amount of their work down there? I believe, but I wouldn't know because okay. it's got to okay. I'm in a different ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, but you know, people are always thinking, well, if you're in uh, any part of the entertainment industry, why wouldn't you go to L.A.? And um, can you address that? Have you ever thought about it, or? Uh, I mean, I've thought more about New York than I have L.A. just because of the like I would for some reason I, it's just new york it for one thing it it appeals to me more but uh i i I've, i would say that you know you can no matter where you are right now it's really tough because there aren't any films or there's not a lot of film or television being made um so it doesn't matter where you are but louisiana get, has been getting a lot of films because of tax credits and it's a great place to to film you know, it's just, you know, in terms of all the different landscapes, the characters, the mystique of the place, it's, uh, I think it's a good place to be. And, and now it might be harder in Mississippi, um, cause I don't think there's as much being done there. Like a lot of times I've worked on films as sound guy in Mississippi because they couldn't find somebody local. So, but if you're in LA or wherever, you're also competing with more people. So there's a smaller like group of sound recordists in this city. Right. There, there's a decent amount. Believe me, there are plenty of people getting tons more work than I am, but that has as much to do with just their, you know, you, you got to promote yourself and I'm not really as good as I should be at that. Um, at the marketing yourself and getting on, you know, getting on people's list to call is, is a, a big part of this job. Um, but there's work to be found here. Uh, it, it's just having a sense of, uh, you know, where to position yourself and what you're, what you're going to do. You right. know, when you're on a film set, like a film film set, a lot of times, especially for the bigger films, there are three positions, right? You got your sound mixer, your boom operator, and your sound utility. And, you know, your sound utility is doing some real important stuff. It's a really, it's a hard job. You're not making as much money as the other two necessarily, but you're also, um, you're, you're also super important. And, and if you do a good job at that, you're going to keep getting called for work because you can make or break 
a, you know, a, a sound department. And, right. um, so, you know, it's, I don't know, it kind of went on a little bit here, but no, yeah, I would say, I would say, uh, going got to one of these bigger, like cities, even Atlanta. Um, yeah, you can find work there. There's more opportunity, but there's also, uh, more people competing for that opportunity. And, um, you just have to figure out what, you know, where you, what kind of ecosystem you want to put yourself into when it comes to the work. Right. Uh, when you're on set, uh, have you got some really interesting things you've had to do to overcome sound issues like you're shooting and maybe it's raining uh, and, and you've got the sound of, of, of the rain hitting a, a tin roof or uh, you've got someone, for instance, in a in an outfit that's got a lot of sequins that might be making a lot of noise and you got to figure out how you're going to sound them and not get as much of that roughly static, whatever is going on yeah. in the sequins. Have you, have you had some real creative challenges where you had to figure out, it wasn't just get a piece of equipment. It was figure out some work around right then oh that, that's constantly happening um a lot of times it's jewelry or or it's oh, the yeah. nature of the fabric or it's a woman in a dress because where are you going to put the the transmitter pack because you know like generally what happens with the transmitter is you run it through their shirt clip it to their their you know belt um but if they're in a dress what are you going to do now they're you know a lot of times what you do is you strap it. There's like straps that you strap it to their leg, but then you got to be like, is this a person who's an actor and they're, they're used to having things like that? Because if they're, you know, in a documentary and they don't really know it, you got to like figure out a way to communicate strapping that thing to their leg because you're like, I'm about to put my hand on your leg, around your leg, you know? So it's, there's a, it's, I still feel a little awkward doing that, but you, you know, you work with that fabrics are always a challenge. So in terms of specifics, I can't think of anything, you know, cause there's, it's happened. It happens so often. I mean, I remember one time having like for myself, I was on a shoot and I was having to navigate a, um, we we're putting mics on people on this boat. It was in uh, Peru and we were dealing with, the challenges of what it was, it was a, it was a documentary and uh, about this young man who was trying to overcome some drug addictions. But part of the story, we were following the, the uh, police on a river in Peru who were looking for cocaine traffickers. So we were all wearing bulletproof vests and flotation devices <laughs> somehow. And I was trying to figure out how to like get mics on these cops that were possibly going to be jumping onto boats with who knows what, you know, drugs and, 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 uh, automatic weapons. So you're like, okay, you know, but your job is to get good sound and not, you know, worry about all the other challenges there you're, you know, you're navigating a lot of things in some of, some of these situations, um, or it can be as boring as a lawyer commercial and you're like, law, their suits are starchy. So they're noisy. Uh, like, well, how are you going to deal with that? Yeah. There, there are webs. There's a, our Facebook group dedicated to, um, basically placement of lavalier mics like the, the good and bad jobs of wow. and, and solutions for it. Like, and people, I was on a film set, a, a doc, it was a documentary at, at, a, at a school and we were moving from like desk to desk to film students. And there was no way I could put mics on these kids. For one thing, it's just like, you don't want to interrupt them in their environment, but it's, it was also just a matter of timing. So I did, I hid the microphones and pencil bags and I would put the pencil bag on the desk where the kid or kids were sitting and position it in a way where it would pick up as much as possible and let this, you know, then we would be able to shoot it. So that was like a, it, those are called plant mics because you're planting a mic somewhere. Okay. You know, there's a, a lot of like when you're on, on filming in a car, a lot of times the mic is planted in the sun visor. So you're constantly trying to figure out like the quickest, best sounding solution in the least amount of time 
Yeah. Because you walk, you're like, it's time. Like when they want it, they don't have, the camera can be like, oh, we need to adjust the light. So we need to do, and they're like, they give them that time. They don't give sound people that time. <laughs> Going yeah. back to your thing about fixing it in post or whatever. They don't have time for you to like really ruminate on uh, how to get what you, you're like, well, the minute I'm on a set, I'm looking around at all the, all the potential challenges and, and kind of think of solutions uh, based on clothing. Also, where are the lights placed or, you know, where are the light sources? Yeah. Um, what, what's the lens size? Like if you hear, like if they're calling out a eight for an 18, you know, they're going to be shooting wide. So you're going to have to adjust that where if they call for like 50 or 75 or whatever, you know, a higher number, I know I'm probably going to be, be able to get in tighter with uh, the boom mic. Right. So, you know, you know, you're thinking about all these different things. You're also looking at the people you're putting mics on, kind of figure out where they're, they're at. Are they comfortable? Are they, are they nervous because they're not used to being filmed? You know, some people are just like laid back. I remember putting a microphone on Willie Nelson. He was a, uh, he it was 10 in the morning. He was drinking a coffee and smoking grass that would paralyze most people I know and just watching TV. And I was putting the mic on him under his, like through his, he had, uh, you know, a pair of overalls. And he was just, he was, he, he was not the least bit concerned because he had just been through this routine the whole time. I was nervous. I was nervous because I was like, I'm putting a microphone on Willie Nelson. But uh, he was just like, you know, do what you got to do. Well, that, that would lead me to a question. Uh, who are some of the famous people you've worked with? And do you have any, you know, kind of fun stories with them? Well, the Willie Nelson one, I guess, uh, to continue on, it was for, because he was in the Dukes of Hazard film that was shot, you know, about 20 years ago. Uh, with like Jessica Simpson and Johnny Knoxville and all them. Well, we we were we were putting a mic. I was putting a mic on Willie as the camera was setting up. We we're on on his bus, and you know just to kind of take my mind off of the, you know how nervous I was. I I told him a story which was true. I said, Willie, I lost a CD of yours in a breakup, and he's like, What do you mean? He said, I said she wouldn't return it to me after we split up, and he asked me, Well, what CD was that? I said. Teatro. It was recorded, you know, out in Los Angeles and uh, with uh, producer Daniel Lenoir. And uh, he said, you sure the CD didn't cause y'all to break up? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> and he said, well, you know what? I made a bunch of recordings that didn't make it on that album with Amy Lou Harris. And uh, would you like to hear some? And I'm like, sure. And so Willie Nelson had his manager put on a like some some unreleased like outtakes from this CD as we were setting up. And I was like, and it was beautiful. I said, this is beautiful, Willie. He goes, would you like a copy? And I was like, bootleg Willie from the man himself. Yeah, I'll, I'll take you up on that. And he he burned a CD for me. Cool. <laughs> right there. Uh, or he had them burn a CD and it's like six songs that – we're, we're not released from this, this album Teatro. Um, so, you know, I, I'm trying to think of any other, I mean, I've worked with so many Matthew McConaughey. There was something I was in Mississippi on. Uh, he was in a film called the free state of Jones. Oh yeah. And you know that film, huh? Yeah. It's, um, and it was like, he got, he was, we were a splinter unit. I don't know if people know what splinter, like there's like B, you know, there's like, there's like, you know, A and B teams on, on films, but Splinter Unit is even smaller. It's like, you know, it's like a as you splintering off. Think of a small group of people that are making, shooting a scene. They don't have nearly the size of the crew, but it's, just, it's stuff they need to shoot for the film. But they, you know, they haven't, they can't budget the whole crew to be there for it. So he was out for a Splinter Unit thing. And um, where the, the transmitter pack was on him, he didn't like, he just didn't, he was very polite about it though. He goes, you know, you know, sound or whatever he called me. Um, he's like, I can't really deal with this. Um, it's, it's distracting me. And I was just like, I took it off him. No questions asked. It's Matthew McConaughey, you know, and he's real, he's real professional about it and everything. So I had to just do it with the boom. And then I figured out places to hide microphones or, you know, being on a shoot with um, Spike Lee, 
um, and having an equipment issue where the smart slate, you know, the, you know, people that may not know what a smart slate is, it's like the, you know, that little clapboard with the numbers running on it. So that's the smart slate. Um, it wasn't working suddenly. At, and we were at an airport filming people getting off an airplane and Spike Lee's looking at me like, he's like, sound, you ready? What's, you know, and, and I'm just like, I'm sweating bullets because I'm like, this I feel like this is going to be the last day I'm ever going to work in film because I'm having a technical issue. <laughs> As his producer comes up and grabs the cable and does something, it loosens it and tightens it again, and boom, it works. And the producer says, yeah, this, this, this always happens to this cable. Guy came out of nowhere. It was like a guardian angel. <laughs> came, came and saved me. Wow. From, from like, like a really, what could have been a really big problem that yeah. I, did not know the solution to that same shoot Spike Lee and I, we were on, we were shooting an interview and the producer, not the same producer, another producer got on set and his phone rang during a, a real powerful part of an interview and inter interrupted like a scene where somebody during, or a moment where during an interview, there was a, there was a, the person was crying, you know, and a dramatic gold Spike Lee turned around, looked at him like, didn't turn off your phone. And they reset the question. Phone ring again. Oh my! Interrupted. <laughs> the guy did not turn his phone off for the second time, and Spike Lee got up, turned around, get the f out of here. <laughs> like, and it's like, well, that's the producer. Which I always joke, the phone rings a lot of times. It's the producer because they're, you know, even though it's their money. <laughs> that they're they're you know wasting by interrupting stuff like that they're they're a lot of times it's you know they're like turn all your phone everyone turn the phones off but it's the it's the producers who are like somehow oblivious or you know more focused on whatever they're focused on or whatnot yeah um, yeah yeah Jessica Simpson on the Dukes of Hazzard saw that I was nervous and she's, you know, cause I, that was like early, early into my work doing that kind of stuff. And, and she looked at me and she goes, I'm not going to bite you. <laughs> <laughs> cause I was putting a microphone on her, but she could tell I was like a little awkward. Cause I'm like, you know, putting down her shirt and trying to figure out how to clip it on there without, you know, touching her breast or anything like that. You know, even though she wouldn't care if there was a slight, brushing of the you know because yeah, she's like it it's and that's yeah. always been you know with me when i've been micing people up uh it's just it can just be so awkward especially when uh you know not just working with a beautiful woman you can be working with a supreme court judge which i've done that yeah. you can work with a with uh someone a governor i've worked with governors and uh all of a sudden, you really need to slide a microphone wire up their sleeve all the yeah. way. And not only that, you know, you know, some of these people have uh, armed guards with them. And so yeah. you don't <laughs> you find yourself not looking at that person, but looking at the guard and with the is this OK type thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So those are those are sort of awkward moments. But um, uh, one last question that I had, because this uh, I, I do a little bit with a soundboard at, at my church. I, I do uh, uh, sound for certain events and all. And mm. those things can be, I mean, once it's explained, it's like, oh, okay, that's what those knobs do. But mm. it's so complex, especially trying to have a sensitive ear where someone's saying, okay, now this does the bass, this does the treble, and this does, I guess, mid-tones, and you're mm -hmm. trying to hear all of that, and you're trying to do, and uh, so I guess two questions is that one, can you develop an ear that really gets sensitive to that kind of stuff, and then on a more uh, almost mathematical sense, or scientific sense, I know they'll be talking about megahertz and gigahertz and doing all this kind of stuff. And it's like, this is really complex physics. And I don't know, and I don't think I even want to try to know this. Hmm. Is there even stuff today that is just so complex for you? It's like, 
I don't really want to get into that. You know, it uh, it's more than what I'm going to need or just I don't know that I could do it. Well, I, I guess it I guess it, not so much in the in, on the production end. I mean, I don't so I don't know a lot of I don't a lot of people kind of assume I can record, I can mix music that's you know on a stage, and I don't really know that. And it's an area that I haven't gone into. I'd be willing to learn it even now because um, I kind of feel like the the foundation has already been set for me to uh, like I have a sensibility that is important too. There there are technical things that one needs to learn along the way like say uh there you want to kind of like pull down the bass on a bunch of uh, channels when you're mixing because you get a rumble so you want to be mindful of rumble so i i would say that the most intimidating stuff for me it, like it has to do with like say a new software uh, or, or software new to me like pro tools pro tools is a standard I haven't touched it until recently. Now I have to like, I, I can do everything I need in software I'm already using, like Adobe Audition for mixing like a, a radio program I produce uh, for a local show about books. I don't need anything as, as complex as Pro Tools, but I'm spending time with tutorials learning it because other opportunities will present themselves that require a knowledge of that software. So I would say that is just an example of whoever's out there listening or thinking about whatever it is they're doing. Um, it, it, it behooves one to learn as much as they can as about as many things as, you know, in within whatever industry they are um, just to expand their knowledge just because that's a great thing for themselves, right. but also it presents more opportunities um, work-wise, and it just gives you a greater understanding of how things work, like how, you know, how, how things are put together. I have more respect for producers who can communicate with me and directors who can communicate with me about what I'm doing because they understand what I'm doing, right. you know? So, um, I, yeah, I would say the, the, the most challenging things that I, in, like, I would be like, if somebody asked me to mix a live, live show, I'd be like, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would, but I would also, or, or record an album for somebody. I mean, I've produced records, but I was using a four track cassette recorder and I had no idea. I, I, a lot of the, best things I've done in my life have been flying into it, not realizing how little I knew. And I just did it. Uh, you know, as I've gotten older, I'm more aware of what I don't know. And that makes it more, I'm more intimidated now in, in a lot of ways than I was when I was younger, because when I was younger, I didn't, I just, I just did it. Yeah. And I, I jumped into things with a, a like less, less caution, <laughs> you know, less prudence. But now I'm like, but, you know, I'm kind of going full circle where it's like, I feel like I, you know, we need to return. I need to return to that kind of like childlike or young person, like wonder where you're just, just figure things out yeah. and go for it, go for it. You yeah. know? Well, George, this has been awesome. I can't believe we've spent an hour. Um, oh, and I, I want to thank you. I mean, your questions have been great. And I, you know, and I, I'm usually on the other side of this equation doing the, the interview. So I really appreciate um, the, the time you spent thinking about these questions and, and the, 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 the way you mapped it out. Well, so. yes. Uh, and would you give us uh, how to contact you, people who somebody who might want to hire you? Sure. I mean, the, the best way is to email me. Okay. And uh, so and that's like just two words, the word sounds and traveling and so it sounds traveling at gmail.com um so uh that's that's also my llc and um kind of like if i were to summarize myself that's exactly what i like to do i like sound and I like travel or I like sounds and i like travel so. awesome awesome well thank you so much george if you've enjoyed this episode think about subscribing you can also check out my podcast at thearthropologist.podbean.com.